Good afternoon and welcome to another Got Safety webinar presentation. My name is Rick Roman. And my name is Michael Crowley. Michael Crowley is president of Got Safety and we are here today to talk to you about the new Cal OSHA regulations that just yep. went into effect last week. Um, the code 3205. Yep. And uh, here, let me share my screen here with you if I could. I appreciate that, Rick. This is the code 3205. It's really something we've been watching come out for a while. But, you know, we really can't start on this a lot of times because of the last minute changes. We find we're doing double, triple, and quadruple work at times. So this thing came out in the beginning of Jan December, and uh, we've got it rock and rolling. We've got everything for you here today. You're just going to love it. This will be easy going, and you'll feel more confident about this as we go forward. Right, Rick? That is correct, because uh, a lot of the things that pertain to this are things that you've already been yeah. doing. Some of the laws overlap with things that have already been going on, but we want to talk and make sure that you're aware of what's changed and what you need to be doing. So uh, what we're looking at here is a news release that came out from the Department of Industrial Regu of Regulations um, just on December 1st, so on, on November 30th, they had their vote and the Office of Administrative Law passed this 3205 code and it is a temporary measure uh, currently expected to expire in October of 2021. Now they couldn't, do. Couldn't come fast enough, Rick. Could not come fast enough October 21. Could not. Yes. Now they do have a couple of built-ins to extend and as they of course always do. Don't you suggest that, Rick. Don't you even suggest it. <laughs> and and hopefully that won't happen. But yeah. nonetheless, uh, the complete code can be found here at the uh, the link that I've provided. And uh, we'll also be providing it to you as a handout if yeah. that's something that you could use for reference. So anyway, um, let's talk about who this actually pertains to, Mike. And there's very few people that are not going to be included in this regulation. If you look here, if you're of a place of employee that has uh, one employee that does not come in contact with other people, then you <laughs> would be exempt. Boy, that is a small group that doesn't have that problem, Rick. One employee, one employee. This is And they can never come in contact with you. I know, um, that's a tough one. You may not like your employees or you have a, a very distant management style, maybe. And then the, the, the next would be employees working from home yeah. that wouldn't fall under this regulation. And lastly, would be employees that are covered by Section 5199, the Aerosol Transmissible Disease Program. Yeah. And so that would be mostly healthcare facilities, as you see right. all of the people that are listed in the bullets below. Um, of course, this only applies to the people who are identified in that program. So yeah. administrators, janitors, and other people who are probably not coming in direct contact with the patients yeah. uh, are still going to fall under this. So it's not the it's not the facility; it's people who fall in the, in that category. Right, right, right. So, a lot of people. A lot of people are covered by that, Rick. There's a lot of people that are covered by this. Yep, I would imagine most of you that are in this webinar are going to fall under this. Yep. So let's go over real quick uh, a few definitions just to make sure that as things are referred to in in our the programs, um, in any of the lessons and materials that we provide, as well as what you would find anywhere else, uh, what OSHA is referring to when these words are used. So the first one uh, would be for uh, a COVID case. So yeah. a COVID case would be, of course, anyone who is tested positive for, for COVID-19. Right. Uh, but it would also be anyone who is subject to a COVID-19 related order to isolate and is uh, as issued by local or state health officials. So that would mean people that have been exposed mm -hmm. to COVID. Um, and then, of course, anyone who has died due to COVID. That's a given given, right? Yeah, if you die, you get a COVID mark on your on that, that it was COVID related. I think yes. everybody that's dying is getting a COVID related nowadays, Rick. It's it's crazy. I, not that I'm judging how we're counting this, but I it's a lot. It's a lot. Yes, it is. So a COVID exposure. Now this is this one here, Michael. This is this one's pretty tricky. So anyone that that has been within six feet of somebody for a cumulative of 15 minutes or greater in a 24 hour period. 
Wow, you really got to lower the amount of time you spend with people. You know what I mean? 15 minutes, that is. So a COVID exposure, if you with 15 minutes, and Rick we would, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're talking about I was with him two minutes today, and then six hours later, I was with him another, yes. you know, 14 minutes. So that's over 15 minutes. And so now we're sitting there, and that would be an exposure. Wow, that, that's a that's a low bar, Rick, that, that, that these beautiful people of California put in for us. So that's just right. something you guys got to know. That's the bar that they're setting for us, hopefully to expire in October. And, and, and of course, I mean, no, no one's using a stopwatch when they're having conversations no. to know how long I was around each individual. So a lot of this is 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 you're just going to have to use common sense and and have an idea of who your people were around. Um, now, if, and, if I may say, Rick, on this issue, when it comes to this 15 minute exposure, the 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 implementation of this, we just got to make sure we teach this principle to our employees. But with that being said, on an OSHA front, I don't know how they're going to enforce this, because like you said, there is no stopwatch that we had that all employees have to walk around with and they click it every time they get with a new person and add it up at the end of the day. This is going to be a very difficult for them to enforce. So I'm not suggesting this is a law we don't have to comply with or we don't need to think about. But this is one of those that you just got to know, man, I don't even know how they would do this. I, I don't even know how they would enforce it. Yes, on an enforcement side, yes, but from, from trying to determine yeah. who may have been exposed to be tested and what have you, you're just yeah. going to have to use your best judgment yeah. uh, as to who would have spent that much time around somebody. Um, but then the next one is the high risk exposure period. Mm -hmm. And it is a time period consisting of one of the following. For a person who develops COVID-19 symptoms, it's from two days before they first develop the symptoms until, until 10 days after the symptoms first appeared and 24 hours have passed with no fever without the use of fever reducing medications. Okay. And then the next would be for a person who tests positive that never developed the symptoms, it would be from two days before until 10 days after the specimen for their positive test was collected. It's a mouthful, Rick. I don't know who's writing this code, and what you just read is right out of the code. Please tell us that's the case, Rick. That is the case. Yeah, and that's, that's the that case. Is their definition. So these are those are the high risk periods. It's a lot of numbers to try to try and, to remember. And we're going to be sending out the slides so that you can read this over and over. So yes. if you're looking at this going, man, that is a tongue twister. Somebody who wrote the Dr. Seuss books is putting this together. Just know that's that's what we're dealing with here in this and trying to understand how this works. All right, Rick. Okay. So the first thing here is uh, as part of this new regulation under 3205, all yep. applicable businesses will be required to create and implement a COVID-19 prevention plan. The plan may be included in the business's injury and illness prevention program or maintained as a separate document. Now, what are your thoughts on, on, on those two directions in your IIPP or separate document? You, you can do this in two ways, and I'm grateful that they've given us the option. Our recommendation is that we build this into a separate program. So on your screen, you should see a copy of the front page of it. It says, for more information, COVID plan, please refer to. That is the cover sheet to the COVID plan that we're writing that complies with this law. The reason why we like it as a separate document is if somebody comes into your facility for motion, they ask for a IIPP or the copy of your injury illness prevention plan. We prefer thus be able to send them the individual documents so we don't have to send them the massive safety manual at one time. The more things to look at, the more possibilities of, of them trying to go through all the cracks and nooks and crannies. So with this thing, we'd like to write this separate document. Now, for 99%, well, 90% of you, we've already created and uploaded to your system these documents. So if you purchased the documentation packets from us, let's just make sure you're knowing that we've got you covered on that. But the rest of the 10%, we should have you done by Friday. No big deal. We'll have it all done. I got half my team shut down just to work on this to get it. We've started writing it in the beginning of December once we knew what this was and we've created it. But like Rick was saying, if you if you haven't bought the program, you can call us or talk to your, insur your, your insurance per provider that if they've introduced you to us. But right here, if you're going to do it yourself, you're, you're bold, you're confident, and you have nothing else going on that you need to do. These are the elements in the program that you would need to put up on there. That would be it. But I'm yes. sure everybody here is pretty busy. 
Yep. And so, like Mike said, if the ones that we've already put up for you, if you go to your Got Safety Client Center, you'll yeah. see the COVID-19 prevention plan. If you still have the infectious disease plan, which was one that we ran uh, previously, which was recommended, was not a required program. It was a recommended program using CDC guidelines. We're replacing that with this. So yep. if you still have the... Uh, infectious disease plan you're part of the 10 percent will be done by the end of the week everyone else should already have the new covid plan um as it says at the top here we have a management uh lesson for this plan that basically will teach your managers and make sure they are aware of their responsibilities and what they have to do for the implementation of this plan and go ahead mike and, and what I'm saying about this this manager's lesson, it is lengthy. Most of the time we try to keep our lessons to one page, two page tops. This one is lengthy because we needed to cover so many elements of this program. So when you see it and it's 12 pages of beauty, just know we didn't do this because we wanted to be irritating. We wanted to put something in that your managers point by point could get this webinar in a very simplistic way that they can implement and know what they needed to do. So yeah. just be warned of that. Yep. There's actually two separate uh, lessons. One of them that is on the code in general, and that's the lengthy one, but there's one that's a little shorter on the actual implementation of this specific program. But if, like Mike said, if you feel so inclined to try to produce this on your own, all of these elements over here on the left are things that that you're going to want to do. You know, you want to make sure that you're communicating to all of your employees that they're aware right. to report and, and so forth. And, uh, you know, you want to provide information to them about getting tested and that way they're aware. And then all of these other elements here that you see are all part of what you would need to have in your program if you were to put t- together on your own. So now we want to talk about some of the elements. Some of this stuff is in the program. And also some of this is what we're going to talk about things that, um, might be things that you were kind of being encouraged to do before but are now actually part of regulation so when you look at the social distancing here um, the two bullet points at the bottom say that uh, installing cleanable solid partitions that effectively reduce aerosol transmission in fixed locations where employees cannot maintain a physical distance of six feet between others and then also maximizing the Uh, quantity of outside air that is provided by mechanical and natural ventilation unless there is a hazard that is posed by outdoor temperatures um, into your air quality. So, So so if you're if once we get into the rest of this webinar, we're going to be telling you that if you have cases, what you're going to have to do. So in the in the right now, what's happened in the past, if you haven't taken these two bullet points seriously, you've got to start doing it. These panels, these separations. What we're going to show you today is that you do not at all want, cases want to get people start getting COVID in your workplace if we can stop it. So some of these things where you're like, man, this is a little over the top on the social distancing square. We don't want the stickers on the ground. We don't want the panels. You've got to just commit to it now this is the time we we i believe we don't have a lot longer and when i say that i i really have no clear idea of what it is but i don't believe we're into this for another five years or so i think that with what's coming out in the vaccinations and whatnot i believe these things are something that are going to be long enough where we have to fulfill but but we we've got to do something because what we're going to show you in a minute man gosh you do not want to get into this other pattern Exactly. And and by by taking these steps, I mean, now yeah. that uh, to, to make sure you don't get in that boat will we'll save you a lot in the long run. Yeah. And, and like yeah. I said, when you get to that, you'll see that it's it's a lot easier to do this than than to follow the requirements of when you have outbreaks and so forth. So um, next is the and, and for the social distancing, the uh, first thing that you, you're going to need to do is the evaluating hazards in your workplace. So you were already, they already were wanting yeah. you to do uh, basically a walk through your facility, looking yeah. for any areas where maybe, you know, uh, if you have opportunities to have people work from home so that you can get people spread out yeah. more to move desks around or, or whatever, work areas around the partitions, whatever you need to do, you need to conduct a risk assessment to be able to uh, see what you can do, what measures you can take to to comply with this. 
And w one of the new things that they did put in the regulations is that your employees have to be given the opportunity to participate in those evaluations if they would like to. And what you see on the screen here when you says there are uh, risk assessment or JHAs, for those that may not be familiar, that's job hazard analysis, and that's what they're doing. So they got to be pro provided to them. The employees got to, should participate if they can to ask them what they feel, what they, what's going on, what's their natural course of working if they walk around the machine, if they're working in this environment, what offices they travel to. You want to get their opinion so that you clearly know what the real working of, of your workstations are. Yep. And, and, you know, by including them in that process, we'll, yeah. we'll you know, get them more vested in, in wanting to make sure that, that we're in good shape as well. So I love we, social distancing, Rick. I, I, I'm not sure I like being close to people anyways. You know what I'm saying, Rick? This is, uh, you can look at it as a positive. Uh, there's, there's people out there you don't want to get close to, so it's a good excuse, right? Face yeah. coverings, Rick. Let's get to face coverings. This is so good. the face coverings. Employers will be required to provide face coverings to all employees and ensure that the employees are wearing them uh, over their nose and their mouth. This includes both indoor and outdoor settings. Face coverings will be clean and undamaged. Face covering policies and procedures need to be communicated to non-employees who are on the premises. Additional policies and procedures will need to be created and implemented to minimize exposure to COVID-19 hazards that originate for persons not wearing face coverings, including members of the public. Now, I'm glad these face coverings have come down in price. Holy smack dogs, in the beginning of this pandemic, they were all incredibly expensive. So remember what Rick just read, and this is the code that the employers will be required to provide the coverings, okay? That's the important part that you need to hear. The next part is that they need to be clean and undamaged. So if you're yes. in a greasy environment or you're you're doing something and they're touching their face and they get dirty, they have to be clean. So that's something that you got to make the judgment on what is clean and what is dirty. Obviously that's easy for some of us and not so much for others, but you've got to provide this as the as the employer now. You you yep. can't just say you're wearing a sock over your face you bring from home and if and if it's dirty, that's your fault, you supply your own. No, you have to provide them. Now they don't have to wear yours. Right. There's nothing in the code that right. says you have to wear yours, but you do have to provide them. And so if yep. they have something that you believe is clean and adequate and doing its job, then you can make your best business choice. You guys are paid the big bucks out there. You got to make your choice on that. Yep. You just got to have some on hand in case the ones they bring home from home become damaged or dirty that you've got a replacement for them. So no, I agree on doing that. You're, you're in good shape. Uh, the next is screenings. You got to develop and implement a process for screening right. employees for COVID-19 symptoms. Employees may evaluate their own symptoms at home before reporting to work. If screenings will take place at work, employees conducting the screenings will be required to wear face coverings. And if the and if temperature checks are part of the process, a non-contact thermometer needs to be used. Right. So the non-contact thermometers, you got to have the screening process. You've got to have some sort of checklist for the employees if they're working from home or they're, or they're coming in so they know what to look for in that. you got to be educating. I know as we look at the CDC guidelines and what the symptoms are, they can change at times. I, I think we're getting down to where we kind of know what it is and uh, everything locked. But you got to set up a screening process so when they come into the office, you're asking them, are you sick? Have you had a fever? Do you feel anything? Let me smack your temperature with a touchless thermometer. It'll be good. Yep. He's, and back to face that. coverings real quick. Um, there are some exemptions, that, uh, but you'll need to look at the code or in your plan that talks about those things. We can't. There, there's so much information in this new code. We would literally be here for six hours and, and your head would explode with all the information. So we're trying to give you the highlights of, of what you really need to know. And what we're saying, Rick, and correct me if I'm wrong, we didn't bring out all the exceptions just because the exceptions were going to be the rarities. You, you, yes. If you're looking for the exception, you're not going to find it. You've got to be one of these unique circumstances, right? Yes. So this is for 90% of you, you're falling into this category right here. Yep, exactly. And, all right. Uh, but yeah, you, you, you're going to want it. You, you're still going to need to, to, by looking at the lessons that we provided, um, that we'll be handing out as well and mm -hmm. and the 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 code and, and what have you you'll have all the, the additional yeah. information so let's move on here to the next now we're going to talk about employee and county health department uh, reporting as well as cal osha so 
those of you that were in our webinar a couple of months ago when the AB 685 came out, which is set yeah. to take effect on January 1st, just know that the things that you were supposed to be doing then, you're basically starting to do now because this regulation went into effect immediately. And so you're going to be doing those. And while this here is set to expire in October, that 685 actually is going to be a two year. So it's not going to be till January of 2023. So these aspects of the uh, reporting and, and uh, notifying employees is something that you need to start doing now. And you're going to be doing this for the next couple of years. And so, maybe, and maybe Rick, when we get to the end of the to October, when this is going to fall out, if they don't extend this, maybe we can do another webinar then to talk about what things are still in place and all that yes. to help them decipher that. That may be a good idea for us, Rick. Of course. And if you do have cases, you're certainly welcome to call us to get some guidance yeah. uh, as to what you do. But obviously, we talked about and you may want to reference. Uh, we'll be providing you the link to the old webinar that you can go to as well to get the information on what needs to be in the employee notification. So we don't need to go over that again. Um, but also this so this new requirement obligates that employers contact the local health department immediately, but no longer than 48 hours after learning of three or more COVID cases to obtain guidance on pre pre uh, preventing further spread of the COVID in their workplace. And additionally now, uh, when uh, COVID-19 serious related illnesses uh, occur or hospitalization and what have you, now you also have to report that to OSHA. So the magic number here, Rick, is three. You don't want more than three. You don't want, in yep. fact, you don't want more than two, right? You three or exactly. more. Right. So you don't want more than two, people. You do not want to get this. So when we talk about the primitive, the measures of before, the social distancing, the mask, the barriers, the guards, remember, three. Now, you may only have three employees, and you can keep them pretty distant, but if you've got a group of people at your facility, remember, three may not be that much at all. You've got to heighten what you're doing to make sure you stay away from the magic number of three. Yep. So, uh, and we'll be going over what what gets you in the time frames and all that in, in a minute on, on what uh, for hitting that three. Right. But uh, the next thing is the record keeping. Employers must maintain records and track all COVID cases while ensuring medical information remains confidential. These records must be made available to employees, authorized employee representatives as otherwise required by law with personal identifying information removed. As per the IIPP, the records need to be kept for a minimum of one year. However, we always recommend that you keep your records for three years, right, Mike? I do because, you know, there's a lot of things that can overlap and whatnot with this. And, uh, you know, you have employees that come and go and then a year from w that point, it's, I, I, I'm a three-year guy. You cover all your bases and you put it down. That, that's really what I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of. Yep. And, and just to make clear, uh, I think I kind of didn't really specify on the notifying of the employees. That would be notifying any employees that have been exposed to COVID. So if you've got people that fell within that 15 minute thing that we talked about and yeah. you need to you need to notify them. And, and, and again, that was talked to in 685. So Rick, if I've got Bob over here that had COVID and I've got to notify you, Rick, that you spent 15 more, do oh, oh, I don't say to you, hey, Bob has got COVID and he's screwed up and we're all going to get sick now. That's it. No, you don't do that because of HIPAA laws, right, Rick? What Correct. you've got to do is you've got to tell them you have been in an area that you have been exposed to. So don't be dropping names and trying to do that. Just got to stay away from that. You really want to yep. get to the spot where you, you'll let your employees know there was an exposure watch yourself and then you can go into those and you things. need to go get tested and so forth yeah so anyway as we continue on here so let's talk about the exclusion of employees from the workplace and yep. the return to work for people that have been exposed and have contracted the covid 19. so uh, to help limit the transmission of covid 19 in the workplace employees who have been identified as covid 19 cases or have been exposed to COVID-19 cannot return to work until the fo following criteria have been met. So for exposed employees, employees who've had exposure to COVID-19 must not be allowed to return to work for 14 days after the last 
known exposure to the COVID case. Um, next would be your symptomatic employees. Uh, for COVID-19 cases with symptoms, they must not return to work until the following criteria has been met. At least 24 hours has passed since a fever of 100.4 or higher has been resolved without the use of fever reducing medications. The, the COVID-19 symptoms have improved and at least 10 days have passed since the symptoms first appeared. Uh, anti uh, anti symptomatic cases must not return to work until a minimum of 10 days have passed from the date that the specimen was collected for their positive, which we talked about earlier as well. Well, so exposure, once again, we go down to that word exposure. Remember, exposure is 15 minutes. So 15 minutes of combined time around somebody who has been diagnosed as positive of COVID. And uh, we don't want to create an alarm. Understand 98% of people who get it survive. But this is where we're at in this. And you've just got to know this is a this is a tall bar of when you're going to exclude. And I don't mean employees that don't have to comply with this, excluding that we've got to exclude the employees from the work site so that that three person getting COVID does not yes. get met. That's what you're doing this for. Because if you get to the three, you've got to start reporting to government agencies and for hey, a small for a bunch of tests. Good night. It just gets nutty. It just gets nutty. Yep. So, so knowing that we have this criteria here, here's another thing. And that uh, the employee pay and benefits. Note that for employees who have been excluded from the workplace and are otherwise available for work, mm -hmm. employers must continue to maintain the employee's earnings, seniority, and all other employee rights and benefits, including the employee's right to their former job status as if the employee had never been removed from their job. In addition, employers may use employer provided employee sick leave benefits for this purpose and consider benefit payments from public sources in determining how to maintain earnings rights and benefits were permitted by law when not covered by workers compensation some of you out there may find this to be fair some of you may find it to be unfair remember this is not a conversation of what it is it is what it is i for me personally pay my employees when they get sick and the reason why i personally do is this i want my employees to know that i'm partnered with them i had a conversation with all of them and their managers have one-on-one -on -one to suggest this is a crazy time we are not lowering your salaries we're doing everything can we can stay in business and you cannot be dishonest with us if you have it don't have it let's not play games. I'll take care of you, but you got to take care of me. Now, I've got great employees and I love them to death. And so this relationship for me has been working out. If you find yourself in an environment where you just don't have that kind of ability, then you've, you, you've just got to you, you got to eat it. I mean, there's just no way around it. You just take this paragraph and know this is what the code is. This is not us making this up. Just absorb it into your into your mind. <laughs> and, yes, and remember, there's anybody who's been excluded. This uh, doesn't mean that they necessarily even have to be COVID positive. It's right. they're excluded because they've been they got to spend 14 yep. days away because they were exposed. You still got to pay those folks. Man, you almost, well, I, I'm not suggesting you wish they had it, but if they get it, then they're only out 10 days, right? You get them back four days early as long as their symptoms are up, right, Rick? Yeah. <laughs> It's terrible. I know. I, I don't know why I'm saying that. Let's move on, Rick. Let's keep this going. These guys got to get back to work. All right. So testing for employees who might have been exposed. Employees are required to offer COVID testing at no cost to their employees during working hours who've been had potential COVID-19 exposure in the workplace and provide them with the information on benefits. Mm -hmm. That so, might be a challenge if people are uh, working uh, graveyard shifts, Mike. Yeah, you know, uh, everybody loves the graveyard shifts, Chris. I, I'm thinking about start one just to keep us busy. Uh, you know, and seriously, when it comes to this testing, you've got to pay for the testing. But a lot of these areas uh, are, they have free testing. So I, I don't understand, depending on where you're at in the area that we are yes. in, we run our offices, we've got tons of free testing going on. I, I, I don't know if there's a lot of places that you have to pay, but just know if you don't have it free, you're going to have to pay. Exactly. There might be a circumstance where you need to get quicker results. I don't know, but if yeah. Yeah, exactly, just yeah. so that the employee's not having to pay for it. Uh, now we're going to get into the, 
all of the other stuff that you we've talked about that you've done to avoid getting to this spot, right? Yeah. yeah. This and and now as we talk about this and, and you thought having to pay these guys to stay home was bad. Uh, if you get into this spot, you'll wish you would have let let some a few more people stay home for a week. <laughs> Rick, before you cover this, I remember we're we're not trying to make light of this. I but you if you thought it was bad before, putting up the plastic partitions, the clear partitions. Rick forgot to turn his phone off. That's great, Rick. I love that. Uh, but but uh, when it comes to all that, we're doing this and telling you the mask, the partitions, the the going through the uncomfortableisms of trying to heighten our attention to this is all for what Rick is going to tell us right now. It's all for this reason right now. Rick, give it to us. Yes. So for multiple multiple uh, COVID-19 in infections and outbreaks, when a business location has been identified by a local health department as a location of COVID-19 outbreak, or when the location has had three or more cases at the location mm -hmm. within 14 day period, employers will be required to do the following until there have been no new cases for 14 days. Uh, so the first thing here is testing. Employers must provide COVID testing at no cost to all mm -hmm. employees at the exposed workplace who were present during the period of the outbreak. Right, right. So if you've got a five-man shop, not too hard. If you got a hundred-man shop and everybody was exposed and you've got to make that determination based on the 15-minute rule of exposure within the six-feet period, that's what you're going to do. Hence the definitions in the beginning of this test. All right, Rick, what else do they got? Well, in actuality, in this case, it's not even the people on the 15-minute uh, exposure. It's anyone who, because, it, because it's an outbreak, they figure it's running rampant at this point. Anybody who was present in that facility oh so in that area where where that employee was it doesn't even give a time frame so everybody in that department you and would rick, have to send and rick let me make sure i'm clear and we're also suggesting there is no part in the code that says what if my uh what if my facility is a hundred uh, is a million square foot it doesn't have a if you're it doesn't have a square footage of you don't have to do it the whole thing so whatever the size of the facility if it's one facility you got to do it Exactly. Because those people are sharing common workspaces, maybe the, you know, the hallways, the restrooms, the lunchrooms. And so they may have been exposed They're at, at this point, you've got three people in 14 days. They're making you test everybody. Everybody. Uh, My gosh, good luck with that. That, that is a tester. Put up your partitions, man. Social distance. This is nuts. Okay. So testing must be immediately provided and employees must be tested again one week after the initial test. A negative COVID test result for employees who have who right. have had COVID nineteen exposure must not impact the duration of the quarantine period or orders by a local health department. After the first two after the first two required tests, continuing testing must be provided to employees who remain at the workplace at least once per week or more frequently if recommended by the local health department or until there are no new cases detected for 14 days. Additional testing must be provided when Cal OSHA is deemed necessary through the insurance uh, issuance of order to take special action. Now next is the investigation. So every time you have a COVID uh, case, case. COVID you case. have to do a, an investigation to see right. what what uh, factors could have contributed to the outbreak. And then now you have to document this to show that you've gone in to see what could we have done differently? What have yeah. we changed? And you need to document that. And then uh, notification. And then once you're in this boat, employers will then have to report uh, any subsequent cases to the local health department. So, Rick, we can continue to the next slide, but let me say as we're switching over, I, I think this is important to know that it is the, it is the stuff that you can do to prevent the, the magic number of three. Once we can stay away from that, we can keep this calm, whatever we do. I think it is the, the, the best choice for you so you don't have to start reporting yourself as a hot spot. Good night, man. You do not want to have to do that. Yep. So now... 
This is probably going to pertain more to larger companies. Uh, hopefully, I would imagine to get into this boat, because if you get into this one, I, I really see no way of getting out of it. This is where you've had 20 or more cases in a, tw in a 30 day period. It, 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 if you've got 20 or more cases going on in, at, at one location, Boy, this is spreading like wildfire at this yeah, point. We, we don't want to be doomsdayers here, Rick. We don't want to be doomsdayers. But remember, the major COVID outbreaks, they are at 20 within 30 days, right? All right. Yep. So what happens, Rick, when we get to the 20 in 30 days? Yep. So employees that are present during the time must be provided yep. uh, testing twice per week and Ooh. more frequently if testing uh, is recommended by the local health department. This testing will be provided again at no cost to the employees. So now you're talking about testing all of these people twice a week. Uh, exclusions, uh, as mentioned throughout the lesson, uh, all of the COVID-19 cases who have had exposure must not be allowed to return to work until they have uh, completed the criteria that we mentioned previously. Correct. Again, with the investigations, I just talked about that, having to do yep. that, find out what contributed, what you can do different. Notifications, all major outbreaks must be reported to the local health department immediately, but no more than 48 hours uh, after you were aware or should have been aware. I can't imagine having three or more cases and not being aware, uh, but and, and that same information is uh, required under the multiple outbreaks must be given to the local health department. You do not want to get to the 20. Heck, my friend, you do not want to get to the three. You want to do what you possibly can to keep yourself clean of COVID to make sure. But there are always cases that happen. Remember, you've got to keep away. So it's three people that get COVID within 14 days that triggers this, the new testing of everybody and whatnot. But if you can get to the 20, you get the grand prize where you have to test twice a week. Now, uh, Rick says there's no way out of this. We don't want to be depressed. But listen, this is you just want to stay away from this, this aspect of it. If you do get to that number, give us a call. We want to know because we may not want to go to your facility. But two, we, we can give you some advice and show you how to and give you some training tips on what we can do to help you. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So that's, I, I was just going to mention that. Good point, Michael. Um, so now we're going to get into some of the things that will probably affect fewer of you, but nonetheless, there are some of you folks out there that uh, this will pertain to. If you are an employer that provides housing to your employees, mm -hmm. very common in the agriculture industry. Um, also, if, if you have folks that are uh, traveling, that if, if they're sharing accommodations and what have you, these are some of the things, and I'm not going to get into too much, much, many of the specifics, but just know know that that you things that need to be considered and yeah. again you'll want to reference your your plan and mm -hmm. and the code to get all of the details of what but there are uh, requirements based on how you make the assignments such as having family members that they be your first priority pe crew members and then people that are off the, the, so you would prioritize how you assign the housing units uh, obviously you still have to have physical distancing controls for them face coverings and then there's cleaning and disinfecting of those quarters that that have to be done and so you you're going to need to know all of that. And then, of course, isolation for cases of people who've been exposed. So if you've mm -hmm. got people in a shared living quarters that gets this, you're going to have to isolate those people. And there's requirements for all of that. So those are all things you're going to have to look at. Rick, you picked an interesting picture for employee housing. That's a tough place looking, my friend. I, I don't know if I got any employees that will want to stay in that. So I, I, if you've got employees <laughs> staying in something like that, that's a tough place. That's a tough place. <laughs> All right, so that's the, the the housing. I don't know how many of we're going to come across that, but it's employee housing. The whole thing. I no. think the thing that's more pertaining to people is going to be this transportation thing. Good yes. night. This transportation because thing is going to be a doozy. Yes, because especially, I mean, this is obviously uh, very prevalent in agriculture, yeah. but you also got landscapers. You've you've got companies that provide ride sharing uh, for, for people that are you know that that are further away, and so. Uh, so where employers provide vehicle transportation for employees to the work pur for work purposes or transportation to and from work, they must do the following to help minimize the spread of COVID-19. So again, the same considerations need to be given on assignments, uh, yeah. where family members, crew members, and so forth. Um, so you've got to prioritize that. Then you've got cleaning and disinfecting. All high contact surfaces must be cleaned and disinfected before each trip. 
Employees mm-hmm. must be provided with sanitizing materials before entering and exiting the vehicle. So that means you got to be using the hand sanitizer before you get in there and when you get out. Plus, they're sanitizing the vehicle before every trip. Right. Screening. Um, prior to allowing employees board the shared transportation. So again, those screening processes that we talked about earlier, you have to implement that before you let people in the, in the vehicles. Uh, physical distancing. Now, this is the tough one, Mike. Physical distancing must sit at least three feet apart from each other. Wow. Listen, you, you may have some tough environments, right? Uh, if you have a truck, a, a quad cab truck, and you're trying to get them in, you've got to make your best judgment. What we're here to do is tell you how this reads in the in, in the code, and then you've got to make your best judgment. We are by no means telling you not to comply, but you've got where you're at in life because you're making the hard business choices to get where you need. You make your best judgment. If you don't fulfill the code, you could be cited or have issues come that way. But this is a tough one to do because a lot of people are packing their trucks and going off and doing some construction or landscaping and they just don't have the ability to take three times as many vehicles so you've got to you've got to plan make the choices for yourselves and go with it i i I, i'm not going to make the choice nor am i going to tell you what to do besides here is the code and i pray that you have the right judgment in your mind to make that good choice yep and so the face coverings uh they must be worn when in the vehicle uh, including the yeah. the operator, everyone has to have the face coverings, and then you have to have ventilation um, absent of of certain conditions. Like obviously, if it's pouring rain or freezing cold or, or uh, you know blazing hot out, uh, vehicles must be kept uh, the windows Ventilate. must be kept open and the ventilating systems uh, set to maximize outdoor air. Yeah, so I don't imagine this means the window has to be all the way down, Michael, right? You you just, you need to get some ventilation in there. You, you got to get ventilation, Eric. And I, I don't know, maybe a crack in the window does it for you, but but maybe you need it all the way back. I mean, you can see in this van you're using as an example, there's only two windows that roll down unless you're driving with the doors open. I right. mean, you got to roll those dang things down. You got to get ventilation to the back of those guys in the back. Uh, yep. But this is a tough one that a lot of you are going to have some questions about. Uh, and you may be putting it into the webinar already that we may be asking. But if you have questions, let us know. But that's what it reads. And, and there's just not a lot we can say about it. I think you all know what we're trying to say. And we wish you luck. Yep. So it, w- we've we've got tons of resources here yeah, for you. Tons. It, 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 if you're if you're part of the God Safety System, whether you're through one of our partners or uh a client of God Safety, you have access to all of these training resources mm-hmm. here. These are lessons uh, that we have available. Actually, I don't even have them all on there. The list is no. extensive. We're, we're providing that for you so that you can see all of the different lessons that we have available that can help keep you out of that three-person reporting madness. But mm-hmm. these are all lessons that we have for you. Um, we have also are going to be providing you... Uh, At the bottom of the video, if you look at the description, there will be links to get a the management um, 3205 prevention regulations lesson. So it's basically a simplified on what's in the code shows you how, how, you know, everything that, that you're needing to do. Then there's also a lesson on the on the safety plan itself. So if we've written your documentation for you, this is a kind of a step-by-step implementation. Um, Of course, we have a lesson for your employees on that. There's also the list of pandemic lessons. The worksheets, Mike, was the the assessments Mike was talking about doing earlier. Uh, We have the risk assessment worksheets in there for you and the job task and precautions worksheet. And we've also got an investigation form for you. Uh, so you're going to have the things that you need, you know, should you have any of these situations. Of course, there's the link to our previous 685 webinar. We're going to give you the uh, the actual OSHA regulation. It's like a 25-page PDF. That, and then, of course, we'll include the PowerPoint slides. 
Our documentation team really deserves a, a shout out. I mean, our documentation and research team has done such a great job through this year putting together what we need to do to keep up to track, keeping an eye on what's coming out and writing these lessons. All the resources that you have, we, we, we thought of a lot of them, but the lessons, the individual lessons, those are requests by our clients that call in and say, hey, listen, I need a lesson on doing this. So once again, if you're watching this webinar, you're probably going to be uh, have access to our free service that is you can cut custom request lessons. And I, you, you got to keep requesting it because no matter how smart we think we are here, which, you know, it is what it is. Uh, the reality of it is you guys know your environment's better and you know what you need to be trained. Our people go out, we make recommendations, but if you're struggling with an area or a circumstance you need lessons with, come on by and we would, we would love to be able to do that. Just put in a request. We'd love to do that. You got some yep. questions and answers, Rick, going on? Yeah. Haven, can you I do go have some questions. what questions we got? Yeah, a lot of questions here for you guys, so I'll just jump right in. This first gentleman would like to know, are there any HIPAA issues in disclosing whether a staff has contracted COVID to the rest of the staff? Uh, Rick, uh, it is. It is. There is HIPAA issues. That's why when we say that if you have somebody that's got COVID, you're going to say, in people in this area, we've got a guy that's got COVID or a person who has COVID, and we need you guys to be aware of that and go get tested. So, yeah, you're not going to use names when it comes to this. And is there a minimum number of employees in the company that these rules apply to? Uh, the minimum number is really one. Once you have more than one employee, right, Rick? It's one employee. You have to comply right. with, with these regulations to some extent. All right, moving on. On an assembly line, if the added partitions cause a hazard, what should we do? You need to redesign the partitions or figure out a way that so they don't. I understand the logic that more safety doesn't always, re, re, uh, you know, end up with lower accidents because sometimes we can safety ourselves where we're just not safe at all. We've got too many processes to get over or barriers to get around. You've got to be smarter than the average bear. You've got to figure out a way to be able to build these partitions and keep people socially distanced without making more safety hazards. If you need some tips or you need some sort of person to come out and give you some advice would be glad to give us a call would love to send out uh, somebody to go over that with you on site what is the timeline for implementation of these programs well the code's been been talked about for a little while now we've heard rumors but it's been implemented in jan in december 1st you had to have it implemented but when we called osha to get some more information they, they were still getting training on it within the first week of december either so there is going to be a grace period that you're going to see the answer is you, you don't want to waste much more days that really is what it is now we're not seeing citations on this as we speak we haven't seen them but uh, you usually see them come out a couple weeks in, in uh, down the road and stuff so what i'm saying to you is you now know it. Don't worry about when you need to. Just start doing it now and let's move forward. I'm sure we're going to be okay. All right. Is Got Safety developing a form for COVID cases who are on site but not employees? For example, a delivery driver makes a stop and then notifies the company later that there was an exposure? If you need a form like that, you're going to call in and we can have our team custom build a form knowing the parameters that you're really looking for. So the answer is yes to any form. Any form that you're looking for, we'd love to help you put it together and do that. You just got to call in. There's just too many little parameters besides a guy delivered pizza. He was here. I mean, what did he deliver? Did he have to bring out a truck? Did he touch? Did he walk in? There's a lot of questions we would need, but the answer is yes. Call in. We'd love to build you a form. All right, here's a great question. What are the consequences of violations? The consequence of violations of being cited and highly annoyed by all the practices and the things you're going to have to send out, that is going to be there. But the citations roll in. Remember, a citation that is a general can go up to three to $5,000. If it's a serious violation, it can be seven to $25,000, depending on the serious nature of it and how they classify it. So I'm not saying these are going to be those numbers exactly, because a citation or a violation when it is written up into citation form is really based off what the inspector feels it is. They have the judgment called to be able to say they feel like it's a serious because of the amount of the employees that were exposed or, or uh, how much in denial the employer was uh, at fault by not fulfilling their, their due diligence to keep their employees safe. So there's a lot of factors in that. 
And let me just say that even just without this code, and obviously OSHA has just been based off the IIPP itself, uh, has, has been issuing tons of citations already. And we've been seeing them that have come in anywhere from 3,000 to the, the highest one that I've seen was a little over $200,000. So the fines could be, depending on your circumstance, they can they could be quite significant. They can be significant, I, I, and and uh, that's that's usually let's leave it there with significant, right, Rick? I mean, good night. We don't want to scare him into into hooting any land. All right, this gentleman works for a landscape company and wants to know how how should we handle having crews of three or four in a truck at a time. My answer to you is you got to make your best judgment. You know the regulation. We've read you the regulation, and you got to make your own best judgment. Here at the Got Safety facility, what we do is we tell this. We teach people good principles, and then we encourage them to run their own businesses. We do not come in there to try to make calls for you or whatnot. What you want us to do is to tell you what is what is going to be the clear-cut code, and then you get to make the choice to it. We've got recommendations on how to do it, but when it comes to the code of how many people you can put in a car, and you got to be distant uh you know the answer is not going to be good so don't ask it unless you really want to know it's a tough answer because if you're not going to go against the code i certainly can't give you advice to go against the code so you can't do that to me you, you just can't do it to me you know that you get paid the big bucks to make these choices so you make them you know what to do it's three feet apart do your thing whatever that is if an employee gets covid outside of the workplace do we still have to pay his time away from work I do. I do pay the time away from work because if my employee got COVID, I want them to be able to tell me they had COVID so that they don't come in because they are dying to work to fake it for a period of time. And then that infects us where I get to the magic of three, hopefully not the 20 scale where I'm into my problem. So you've got to make this choice. This is a tough time. And I totally understand some of you are going to be offended by suggesting that, that they're going to go to some party or aftermarket craze land, and then you've got to pay the penalty to it. I know it sounds terrible, but I am saying this for me, I do pay because I, I believe I'm building something more than a six month employee roster. I feel like I'm building a team and I need my employees to see me as a partner and that I teach them good practices and I hope that they govern their lives in the right way. We both know that not everybody makes good choices, but just know this. I really believe that we've got to do everything we can to make sure everybody is as clearly honest as they are possible with what symptoms they have and when they have it so we don't get into the three or the 20 person problem and we get through all these regulations. We got to stay away from that. And, and so technically where you wouldn't have to, it, it, it's really the smart choice yes. because since no one can really prove for sure where they got it, you, you don't yep. want this coming back to you. Yep. All right. This gentleman would like to know, do the barriers need to be constructed in areas where the employees clock in and out, even if they're just there for a few seconds? Uh, if people are not, if their people are going to be within six feet of each other, you've got to make that judgment call. I'm saying to you, if you've got a lot of people going to one single area to touch, feel, breathe and all that, you're going to want to put up some sort of barrier that, that while they're there, it is as clean as possible. But there's just too many environments. When you look at the, where these clock in stations, how close they are, how far apart they are, it, it, just give us a call and let's have that conversation specifically one-on-one -on -one and we can give you more answers to that. And you just want to make sure they're they're not cluttering together. Like Mike said, if they're six feet apart, th that you're and they're masking, you should be pretty good. Yep. All right. Looks like we got about time for three more questions. For employees that that claim to have been exposed, do we require proof that they have been exposed, or just take their word? Listen, that's a tough one because I don't know what claims they're exposed means. I, I don't know what that is. I mean, you're not going to mandate that they give you a positive test of somebody else that's not their employee. I mean, that that that's difficult to mandate. I don't see that. But if an employee has been exposed, I don't know how you don't trust them. I just don't know what you do about that because if an employee says my cousin's third brother's was was COVID and I had a par family gathering and now I'm exposed and you say, well, I want to see his positive thing. Okay, he shows it to you, but that doesn't prove they're at the party together. I, I think it's a it's a question that you already know the answer and you're irritated by. You're gonna you're you're gonna wanna treat it as if it's true. All right. And does this do these written policies have to be part of our employee handbooks and safety manual? 
Remember the employee safety handbook and the employee manual, uh, the employee the employee handbook and the safety manual are two different books, and I like to keep them that way. The employee handbook does refer to the safety manual, but you don't want to mesh these two the books in my mind. Keep them separate. So when OSHA comes out, they're looking at a safety manual, and if you have some HR issues, they're looking at the employee handbook. Keep them separate. All right, and we'll end with this question. Um, is, would you advise us to stop providing snacks such as coffee and donuts during the pandemic? No donuts? Oh, you got to provide. No, I'm kidding. Listen, I love donuts, but really what we do here is I provide snacks for my people. I, I have the Schwann's guy come by. I kick that freezer full of ice creams. They're individually wrapped. So if you're going to provide things, you just want to keep to the individually wrapped section. But you may be in an environment where you go, listen, we're going to for forego this for now because it's just too much. People are not making good choices. You're not able to manage it well. You may have crazy people working for you. I, I don't know. There's a lot of odd circumstances, but if you're going to provide Provide snacks individually wrapped snacks I think are the best way to go about that best way to go so that's a no to the uh, giant pack of M&Ms you know or the bar nuts where you put your hand in these nuts no yeah you can't what are you doing don't go to Costco and get that first of all nobody needs this right come on look at it we're, we're big enough but the reality of it is no you don't want to do that no you're right all right Haven is that it brother I guess that it is, is. It. No more questions. Hey, I just want to say thank you for what you guys got going on out there. I know this is a struggling time for us to be able to put everything we've got into running our businesses and then get kind of hit in the face with some more regulation that we've got to see. We've all seen the videos online of people that are dying out there, struggling out there to run their shop and understanding what, why our government makes these rules or whatnot. We can complain all we want or we can just pull up our pants and get to work and start doing what we do best is, is capitalist systems in these private sectors to figure out a way to do business. And so we're here to help you in that, in that, in that avenue. We're, we're here to be your friends and to make sure if you have any questions, give us a call. Uh, Rick, do you have anything to add with this, my friend? No, that is it. Uh, we, we definitely appreciate uh, your attendance. And as I mentioned with the uh, video replay, you will have uh, a link below to all of the resources that uh, we talked about here in the webinar. And th thanks for coming. So with that being said, my name is Michael Crawley. This is Rick Roman, and we are your webinar specialists on COVID-19 apparently for today. And we will see you next time. Thank you.